Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Margaret McNamee, and I am Professor of Fire Safety Engineering at Lund University in Sweden. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to, to a, the session entitled, By Meeting Our Green Goals, Are We Not Adding New Risks? And as we're starting up, a colleague, uh, Lila Quayle, will launch a simple poll to give us a feeling for the different backgrounds that we've got represented in the room here. So don't worry if your exact field is not in the list to choose from, just try and choose a category that best suits you, or if nothing is even close, then just choose the catch-all category, and um, we'll have a look at that in a minute. So in this session today, we're going to have three speakers. They're going to present different aspects dealing with this same question about by meeting green goals, are we not adding new risks? Um, they'll be looking in terms of building products, in terms of electrical uh, safety and electrical, electrically caused fires, mm -hmm. and finally, from the perspective of fire mitigation. Each of the speakers has an allotted time of approximately 10, 15 minutes for their presentation. And there will be time for some questions during that allotted period of time, or at the end, we'll have a panel discussion as well. Uh, I'd encourage you to post any questions that you have in the chat. We decided not to divide it up into a question and answer um, button and a chat button. We're just going to use the chat for all of the questions and I'll try and make sure that uh, I can pick up some of the questions from there during the panel discussion. Um, but the speakers as well, when they're not speaking, will try and get into the chat and answer some of the questions as they're coming up because we won't have a huge amount of time uh, in order to deal with all of the questions that hopefully will be popping up on the chat there. So before we start with our speaker, I wonder, Lila, is it possible to see what the division of answers is on the poll? Or maybe I should go through the house rules first. Um, so you see here, the red chat box on the side of your screen is where you can present yourself and also ask questions. If you want to ask a question to a chosen speaker, please state his or her name. Uh, don't touch any of the buttons at the bottom of the screen on the red box, otherwise you will kick everyone out of the session, and I think that would be a little bit unfortunate if we do that ahead of time. Um, you can click on the down arrow to make that disappear from your screen, so, so I would advise that you do that. I've certainly done that because I don't want to um, click on it by mistake. And to exit the session, then the best way to do that is to uh, click on the button that on my screen says return to lobby, but it may on your screen say back to lobby at the top right hand of your screen. And the session and the chat will be recorded so that uh, I hope that everyone understands that and is okay with that. So then my question to Lila, were you able to launch the poll and uh, can we see any of the results? Yes, the poll was launched and normally I'm sharing the results right now. So you cannot see it, I believe. Okay, well, hopefully everyone that's in the room will be able to see them. And uh, for those of you who can see them, then you'll have an idea of what the distribution of different backgrounds is in those of you that are participating here. Unfortunately, I actually can't see it. So um, hopefully someone can tell me a little bit about that in the chat. So what I'd like to suggest now is that um, I start by introducing the first speaker. I think Lila has actually put the results of the poll in the chat as well. So I'll come back to that between the speakers. Our first speaker is Anna Stian Hansen. She's Professor of Fire Safety Engineering at Norwegian University of Science and Technology, uh, MTNU in Norway, and is also Chief Scientist at RICE Fire Research. She's worked in the field of fire and safety science for decades and is an internationally renowned scientist in the field. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Anne today, who will be presenting about the fire safe use of green construction products. Anne, the floor is yours. So thank you, uh, Margaret, and, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this, uh, to this uh, session. I'm very delighted to, to give this presentation. So, fire safe use of green construction products is my topic for today. 
so this is a little bit about me, as, uh, as Margaret already introduced me, I, I won't uh, repeat this. But I'll also um, uh, add that I'm director of the Fire Research and Innovation Center in, in uh, called Frick, which is um, here in Norway. And I'm also the uh, president of uh, EGOF. This is my last year as in the uh, as a president, but it's uh, it's relevant to this uh, topic, I would say. So uh, this is a brief overview of my presentation. Uh, the focus is on combustible construction products, and the examples I use are wood and thermal insulation. Uh, and in the end, I try to give you some thoughts about the way forward in this short time. So, new uh, many changes in the construction industry may affect fire safety, some in positive ways and other in negative ways. We are building higher and bigger, often while using combustible materials. We apply new innovative uh, building products and the design may be innovative too. Um, and uh, energy efficiency is a requirement and may lead to more airtight buildings, more insulated buildings, and maybe also more use of combustible products. Renovation and rebuilding may change the fire safety of a building, and the cities get more dense with less space between buildings, where, which may uh, pose a fire hazard. And then we have new energy systems like PV systems, energy storage in batteries and hydrogen. Uh, they may also represent a fire safety challenge in buildings. Uh, these are some of the innovative construction products, and I, I know there are many, many more. Uh, new use of existing products may also be a, a possibility, so not only uh, new develop uh, uh, products, but also using existing products in a new way. So you see here polymers, nanoparticles, wood-based products, composites, vacuum insulation, and something we've never heard of before that will certainly appear. So uh, regulations and fire safety engineers need to be prepared for the future. Uh, we need to ensure that the fire safety in the end use application also is at an acceptable level. So to wood. Uh, wood has many positive properties and several countries, including Norway, where I come from, have more use of wood in constructions as a politi political goal. And one of the reasons for this is to reduce the emissions of CO2. Uh, other positive pro properties is that wood is easy to shape, easy to, uh, to uh, make constructions. Uh, the, it has good thermal properties, a decorative appearance, and it's also said to be beneficial for indoor climate and for the well-being of, of people. But there are also some negative um, properties, as you know. It's hygroscopic, it absorbs water, and uh, may be vulnerable for deterioration by fungi, insects, and also weather conditions may break down the material. And of course, it burns. We're using, uh, we are using uh, wood as, as a fuel, so we know it's burning. And it's a challenge how to handle this. So there we are. So this is an example of a recent project in my hometown, Trondheim. It's called Moholt 5050, uh, and it's a student housing which was finished in uh, 2016. I don't know if you can see my arrow here, uh, but, but uh, there are five uh, blocks of student housings with five floors each and also service building in between, and there is a kindergarten to the left with these nice colors. And the fire safety has been a focus in this project. All rooms are sprinkled. There are plans for safety management, for maintenance, for example, by, for treatment of, of, of the facades, etc. And just to say about the name, Mohold 5050, that has nothing to do with the chances 
for fire or not, but it is related to that. We have 50 years of experience of student housings in um, in um, in uh, Trondheim and 50 years to come. So this is another example of a large wood building, a building in Skellefteå, north in Sweden, that was presented in this article in The Guardian two weeks ago. And it was also posted on LinkedIn. And uh, there were very many comments from fire safety engineers. Uh, the description of possible fire challenges was considered sparse and overly positive. As you can see here, it's fire safe, slow to ignite, uh, 120 minutes protection, and that, that could be right, but um, it might give a very simple building, a uh, simple impression of, of building with wood. So there are wood enthusiasts and there are wood skeptics. So who should we listen to? If we fail to build fire safe timber building, it might, might end like this. this shows the situation when the fire brigade arrived at the fire in a block of social flats in Norway in August. The fire is still under investigation by the police, by the fire service, the insurance company and by Frick. So how could the fire develop so fast and grow so big? And on the positive side, why were there no injuries and fatalities, despite the fact that the occupants in this building were considered as vulnerable in a fire situation? So here you see the building before the fire, and you see it was quite extensive use of wood in the balconies. And here is the uh, building after the fire. So we have quite a clean burn here. So the safety margins may often be smaller for combustible materials. And the vulnerability for fire is often larger than for non-combustible construction products. So I believe it's possible to build safely with wood and combustible insulation, but we, know, we need to know how to do it right. So, Preventing buildings from being destroyed by fire is in itself uh, sustainable. But how to maintain the fire safety level, how to make the fire safety sustainable? And that is related to wear and tear, uh, to reuse of construction products and changes to the building. How do we ensure that the fire safety levels uh, are maintained? So I think a key, uh, key point is holistic fire safety management. How does the use of the building relate to the fire safety design and how to maintain the intended fire safety level? So uh, the surfaces, maybe you need to uh, renew the surface treatment, inspection of uh, fire safety measures, service, uh, fire separating members, uh, to avoid any fire starts, internal and external, and also that the building is used according to the fire safety uh, design conditions. And I would say the devil is in the details, and we need to know how large and small details in a building affect the fire development. Also in the design phase, we need to apply holistic uh, view, how are the details interrelated? How can we prevent a fire from developing uh, unacceptably? So there has been much research related to wood and insulation over the years. And this is just a tiny, more or less random selection of relevant research. And I'm sure I have forgotten many important contributions here. But look at this as examples on bricks used to build the required knowledge to increase the fire safety. Um, yes, there. Uh, uh, so this is 
uh, a photo. These are photos from a PhD project in Frick, where the fire performance of wooden eye joist with combustible insulation is investigated through testing. And the test uh, results increase the knowledge about how these types of materials can be used in a fire safe way and are valuable input to the revision of Eurocode 5 on fire safety design of timber structures. And here we see another uh, ongoing project. It's called Firewood, and the focus is on structural joints and adhesives in cross-laminated timber, glued laminated timber, and wood-based eye joists. And this project is coordinated by RICE and has several partners from European research institutes and industry. So it's all about competence. Uh, uh, to knowledge, we need knowledge, we need experience, we need education, and we need dissemination of our findings. So fire safety education is needed at all levels in a variety of professions. That means scientists, architects, designers, engineers, craftsmen and women, of course, building owners and many, many more. And of course, the work of fire safety engineers and the skills must be acknowledged and valued. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, please um, post any questions in, in the chat to the right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for opening this session, I think, with some very good thoughts about how, uh, you know, what the challenges are we, ha we have with uh, these kinds of building technologies and emerging types of buildings. Um, I, I will wait with questions uh, until the end for the discussion, but uh, as you said, post uh, questions now in the chat and Anne will be able to, to answer those uh, while she's not actually giving her presentation here while we're listening to the others. Thank you. Our next speaker is Olivier Tissot. Um, sorry, our next, yes. Our next speaker is Olivier Tissot and Olivier is a manager of Green and Healthy Buildings in the European Copper Institute and the coordinator of FEEDS of the FEEDS Secretariat and FEEDS is the Forum for European Electrical Domestic Safety and today Olivier is going to be talking to us about electrical safety, a time for action. Please Olivier, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you Margaret for this uh, introduction. Um, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, today I will talk about electrical safety and uh, time for action. Uh, time for action is a really a hot topic, I would say, because uh, we are talking about uh, uh, the green goals and uh, are we not adding new risks? The thing is that um, you all know that uh, um, the energy transition uh, will be mainly based on electrification. And um, the problem is that electrification will be not an issue uh, for the Green Deal for tomorrow, but uh, electrification um, is strongly related to electrical installation and electrical installation are already a big issue here. So um, it's really time for action. And uh, today I will talk about, um, of course, um, uh, the electrical installation and uh, all the issues related to um, what we demonstrate through FEEDS, uh, the Forum for, uh, electrica for European Electrical Domestic Safety and all the results uh, we gather. Uh, so, okay. Uh, Margaret already made a short uh, presentation. I'm working at the European uh, Copper Institute and I'm also the manager of um, the FIT Secretariat. I already worked for more than, more than 15 years um, in France, uh, leading a campaign on electrical safety. 
And for a few years now, I'm working at European level through the FITS Forum. Uh, a short overview of the presentation. I will first make uh, an introduction about uh, FEEDS, who we are, what we are doing, and then I will talk about uh, our outputs, our reports, and uh, our data. And um, finally, I will um, talk about uh, what we ask for. So first of all, um, the FEEDS. Um, the Forum uh, for European Electrical Domestic Safety is a think tank and a do tank uh, that brings uh, together organization aiming to improve uh, electrical safety in dwelling. Uh, in fact, FEEDS wa was created in uh, 2001. Um, that time, we edited a, a first report and um, we had really uh, strong clues that um, uh, electrical safety was really a matter of concern in Europe. But um, that time, we didn't have um, strong data to, um, uh, to demonstrate uh, that, uh, that issue. Um, in 2001, uh, we started, in fact, local campaign in countries. And uh, uh, those campaign uh, didn't start everywhere in Europe only a few countries, but uh, we, we have been able to elaborate some interesting data. And um, uh, four years ago, the feeds was reactivated, really with European ambition, uh, based on um, a new set of data. We, we are participating into the FIRE information e um, exchange platform, which is hosted by DigiGrow. Um, we organized also, and we've been part of the first European Fire Safety Week, which is organized by um, the uh, European Fire Safety Alliance, uh, which we are a member. We participate also to the Fire Safety Engineering Expert Network, and we edited two reports uh, that uh, I will talk um, uh, soon uh, in more details. And we have a website where you can find all the information um, I will talk about. Uh, our members, we have really um, a very interesting variety of members because we have, uh, for instance, consumer association, we have fire officer organization like European Fire Safety Alliance, like the Federation uh, of the European Union Fire, fire, um, fire Officer Associations. Um, we have uh, insurance companies, we have um, a lot of uh, European uh, professional organization uh, dealing with electrical components, uh, installers or cables. And we all working uh, in the same field and uh, our aim is really to fight against uh, domestic fires uh, of uh, electrical source. When I'm talking about electrical source, uh, I'm talking about installation, but also appliances. So that's very important. Um, we are uh, mainly working in two areas. Um, of course, uh, one of our main um, topic is to uh, collect and improve the quality of data related to accidental fires from electrical source and more generally about uh, electrical safety issue. Uh, we also made a strong inventory of good pra practices already existing in European countries. Uh, to fight against fire from electrical source. But really, our aim now is to act at, at European level uh, to implement the necessary measures. Well, now uh, let's uh, dig into our um, two reports. Uh, one edited um, in uh, 2020 and the other one uh, this year. So the first one, and I will focus only uh, on data at this stage uh, because the first one is quite uh, long. There is almost uh, 50 pages and uh, there is an inventory of best practices. But I just want to focus on main data because you will see that uh, it, uh, it will uh, guide us to the main conclusion, which is quite impressive. So 
uh, very importantly, data are not statistics. We are not doing statistics, we are just collecting data. Uh, but um, a lot of data are missing in, um, in countries, and, but we, we based our um, inventory on uh, reliable uh, data. And from uh, this data, we built uh, a model, and the uh, four models have been uh, set up for Europe. Uh, because the situation uh, uh, in dif di different European regions are different, uh, the one for, from the others. And I will just give you uh, here on the, on the table an example for um, uh, Northwestern Europe. In fact, we based our model on three countries, France, Germany, and UK. And from those reliable uh, data which are close to statistics, we um, make um, cross-checking uh, verification. Uh, we ask our members to improve uh, our data. And then we go to the conclusion that in that region, one out of 600, 636 dwellings experience a fire uh, of electrical source each year. And when we put all the figures all together, um, we arrive uh, to uh, these figures on the um, uh, bottom uh, right hand side. Uh, they are near uh, 200,000 fires from electrical source in Northwestern Europe each year. So we duplicate this exercise in the three other regions, Nordic country, Eastern and Central Europe, Southern Europe, and uh, we go to the conclusion. And the conclusion is this one. In Europe, 25% to 30% of fires have an electrical source. Um, it's, it's, it's really impressive and uh, uh, we know that it's um, the major source of domestic fires in Europe. So, uh, the second report is uh, dedicated to accidental electrical domestic fires. Um, why accidental uh, electrical uh, domestic fires? Just because, uh, by definition, accidental fires are all preventable. So, uh, there are uh, action that we can take to avoid those fires. So in that case, the set of data was a little bit reduced. Uh, we worked on um, four countries, France, Germany, UK, and Poland. And to um, draw our conclusion, uh, in fact, the exercise, the exercise is um, the redistribution of unknown source of fires and zeroing uh, arson. So um, on the table, a quick example, which is dealing with uh, Germany and data uh, from uh, 2019. Uh, at the bottom of the table, you can see non inspected and uh, no fires, which are 33% uh, of all fires. And so the first thing we did is to redistribute those unknown fire into the, all the previous categories. And you can see already there that electrical sources are the most predominant one. And then, um, by definition, arson are not preventable. So we erase arson from this data and we redistribute all the percentage. And you see that at the end of the exercise, there are 47% um, of um, accidental electrical uh, of accidental domestic fires, which have uh, an electrical source. So, and finally, we made about the same conclusion in other uh, countries with some difference, but at the end, we can say that, we can say that the slide is coming. Okay, here it is. Uh, we can say that in Europe, 50% of accidental fires have an electrical source. Okay, so um, we have really uh, strong data and what we want, once again, it's a bit slow, sorry. 
what we want is the fire not to start, okay? Because electrical source is a technical source um, that could be, the, um, there are, these fires from electrical source are preventable and there is nothing impossible to do in that field. So, uh, considering that electrical domestic fires have a predominant share in Europe, and considering that these fires are largely preventable, uh, of course, prevention is essential. Um, I will speed up a little bit the process. Um, well, um, just a few things uh, here. Uh, for each type of fire, FEEDS propose a rating of existing preventive measure. Um, just one example, in the, in the, um, for cigarettes and candles, you can understand that standardization and periodic maintenance is a bit useless, but awareness is quite important. In the field of electrical, the, um, standardization and periodic maintenance and inspection are a very, of a very high importance. And just to illustrate that, um, I show you what's happening in other countries. Why there is 24 times more electrical fires in Europe than in Japan and 7.4 uh, 7. 7. times more than in the USA? Um, you can see here the figures. Um, this is the number of electrical fires in dwelling for 1 million of dwelling, only 50 in Japan per year. So why? Just because there are periodic inspection, mandatory periodic inspection each four years in Japan. In the USA, the situation is a little bit different because the inspection regime can vary from um, a state to another one, but there is a strong awareness campaign. So uh, inspection of electrical installation are key to reduce the number of electrical fire. Um, due to the subsidiary principle in Europe, uh, um, the, the safety concerns are the responsibility of member states. Uh, so, uh, where and how we can act? Um, our main target is to include electrical inspection into the energy performance of building directive, so-called DPBD, and uh, the long-term renovation strategy that belongs to member states. So we work on, on that topic and uh, we recently had a very good news because uh, Sean Kelly that I would like to find uh, to thanks on uh, this occasion and um, his teams of MEPs uh, put a very interesting amendment into the ITRE draft report on implementation of the EPBD. And as you can read here, all our main figures are quoted and there is a strong call for um, uh, electrical inspection regime, regimes to be included into the LTRS. So um, I really ask the audience if, you, if anyone or any organization could help us to keep that am amendment until the end of the process, uh, the legislative process, we would be very happy. So don't hesitate to contact us. Um, just to conclude um, the topic on electrical safety, when I was preparing this summit with uh, Rod Rodolphe um, uh, from um, FireSafe Europe, we, we, we all agree that uh, there was not a lot of events related to fire safety um, in Europe. So um, I just want to um, inform you that there will be another event uh, in December, organized by the European Fire uh, Safety Alliance. And FEEDS will talk uh, twice during that, e that event, the 1st of December and the 2nd of December. So if you want to deepen this topic, don't hesitate to uh, participate to this event, uh, which is called the European Fire Safety Week. And uh, to conclude, just want to uh, remind you uh, my uh, personal contact, um, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, just a reminder um, about our um, internet website where you can find all our reports and all uh, the details uh, regarding feeds. And I really thank you for your kind attention, sorry. 
Thank you so much, Olivier, for this very interesting presentation about the important issue of uh, fire safety, uh, electrical fire safety, of course. So um, I think we'll also defer questions to the chat and then to a panel session where I'll ask all of the speakers to come back at the end of the three presentations. So our final speaker, I think, is someone who recognizes that why, while fire prevention is key, fires do actually happen. And in the case of fires, detection is uh, extremely important so that we can minimize what the impact of those fires might be. So let me welcome our final speaker, Shane Lyons. Shane Lyons has worked in business development for EI Electronics, the Irish residential fire safety manufacturer for over 15 years. He's been constantly involved in awareness campaigns, legislative discussions and standards development throughout his uh, career. And today, Sean is going to give us a presentation about smoke alarms. Sean, the floor is yours. I actually can't see you, Sean, but you can we hear you? I can hear you. Okay, it's good. Hi, everybody. Hi, Sean. Welcome. Go for it. Oh, geez, I'm in the dark. Yeah, <laughs> we can see you and we can see your slides. So we're good. Yeah. To okay, well, so that's, um, yeah, my apologies. For that. I, don't know, I rebooted my laptop here a little while ago when I saw it wasn't working. And then I got it going, but it seems to be gone again there now. Anyway, anyway. okay, thank you, everybody. And thank you all for the very it's a very nice introduction, but also the very interesting presentations that have gone on beforehand. Um, Paul, in his introduction, gave some shocking figures uh, with regard to fire safety in Europe, and I was, you know, I was really pleased to see the focus of feeds on residential fire safety. Uh, thank you, Olivia, for that report, which I will read with great interest, and hopefully we'll have a conversation about it sometime soon. Um, I'm, I suppose I'm less data and analytical dri driven, I'm more field experience because we're out there uh, working with customers who need to install smoke alarms, who are looking at the various countries where smoke alarms are installed and where they're not installed. And um, I commend the effort as well of the community that's in the project that you're taking on. Um, you know, fire safety in buildings is important. My focus is fire safety in residential homes. Um, residential smoke alarms are required in approximately 50% of the uh, homes across Europe. Some countries require multiple alarms per property. Some countries only require one alarm per property. And of course, 50% don't require any at all which is uh, is shocking. But the, the reason why it's shocking is because 80% of fire deaths happen in people's homes where we think we're safe, where we think we're secure, but people are not putting in the basic protection to save their own lives, to save the lives of their family, to save the lives of the elderly and children who are less able to get out in the event of a fire. I just wanted to show Let's see, how do I get to the next slide here now? Just click there. There we go. I uh, just wanted to just say, talk about how fire develops and why early detection is crucial. So, you know, in the air ignition uh, phase, uh, we can smell. There's generally a some odor of fire. Then you get to phase two where you start to see smoke appearing and phase three is where flame appears and then phase four is where there is it's hot to touch you can get burned um and uh, you know, the the destructive phase rapidly accelerates after that and the smoke alarm is designed to act between one the you know, the very early stages between initial ignition and before smoke is generally visible to the eye so smoke alarms contain optical sensors that are very sensitive to very small particles. And because smoke rises, smoke alarms are generally installed on the ceiling so that they will, uh, so that they will detect as early as possible. Um, today, it is estimated that we have approximately three minutes from the start of the fire to exit the property safely. 
uh, therefore reaction time is important. The ability of the alarm to alert any occupants, especially those who are sleeping, is critical. And as we are all aware, 70% um, of fire deaths happen at night when people are sleeping. Uh, you become, just go back to that one again there, you also just point out the green bubbles there uh, where you can see the carbon monoxide is starting to be produced. And if you have flames or smoke in your, in your bedroom while you're sleeping, the carbon monoxide will put you into an even deeper sleep um, in the event of a fire. So just to quickly say, you know, the smoke start, smoke then start from, obviously, you know, Olivier was talking about his electrical fault. Here, here I'm just using an example of somebody leaving uh, an object of clothing or a towel or a sheet on an electrical radiator. Smoke starts to be produced. Uh, the smoke rises to the ceiling and, you know, fills up the room. Um, and therefore, it becomes difficult to breathe and difficult to see where we're going. Therefore, the smoke alarm must alert alert you as early as possible there. How much smoke is produced in a fire? If you assume a property of 100 square metres, 2.5 metres uh, ceiling height, you're talking about 250 square metres of free space in the property. And, all right, jump ahead there. And one kilogram of paper uh, could produce enough smoke to fill four homes of that size. So it doesn't take a lot of uh, combustible material to produce smoke that is uh, so enough smoke to cause uh, people to lose uh, consciousness and to not be able to see where the fire, what's happening. I was using an example there of a fire in a kitchen. And, you know, there is, you can see the smoke developing from the kitchen, heading into the living room, through the open doors and down through the house. No smoke alarm present there. Um, so the uh, obviously there's no warning for the occupants until the actual smoke gets into the room. Here you have a smoke alarm uh, just in this location there in the hallway. Typical, typical for people to put their smoke alarm in there. At least, you know, once the smoke gets out of the kitchen, there is a warning. That's the only escape route, therefore, uh, people can get out of their rooms and um, and get out and escape. There's the smoke alarm sounding. You can see roughly 90 decibels at one meter, or as the standard requires, 85 decibels at three meters. So sufficient, sufficient sound, sufficient noise uh, to warn everybody. However, if the doors are closed and the fire, fire, all uh, fire officers these days recommend that we should be closing all the doors of our rooms at night to prevent the spread of fire. And that is a very, very good solid advice, but it will stop the smoke from getting out of that room. Therefore, the people in the property will not be aware of a fire and they will do this because the smoke alarm will not sound. So therefore we recommend multiple smoke alarms in a property. In this case here, there is one in the living in the living area. It's well enough away from the kitchen so there won't be any false alarms due to uh, you know, steam, burning the toast, whatever. We're all familiar with the different problems you can, that can cause small, uh, false alarms. And that will start sounding and hopefully it will be strong enough. It'll be, the sound level will be enough to get through to people uh, in the, down in the bedroom and the sleeping quarters. However, depending on the size of the property, that might, might not always be the case. Therefore, the, we recommend that smoke alarms are interconnected uh, in the property, thus allowing once the first smoke alarm is triggered, the second smoke alarm will be automatically activated and the occupants will be, will be warned at the earliest possible um, moment. Uh, if the fire starts somewhere else in the property and you only have a smoke alarm in the living area, a similar kind of problem. You know, the smoke is coming out of the bedroom and going, in, going to the other bedroom, going to the hallway, but no other smoke alarm to be activated. And because the doors are closed, the smoke alarm, the smoke is not getting to the location of the alarm. Therefore, once again, uh, it's a requirement. In my own home, I don't actually put smoke alarms in the car doors. I put smoke alarms in each of the rooms. 
Therefore, if you have a bedroom with a bedroom drawer closed, and the smoke alarm will activate immediately in that bedroom once the once the fire uh, once once smoke is is evident, and uh, all the other rooms in the house are immediately alerted. And that's so that kind of that's really covers all that. Yeah. So just kind of talking about what's happening in the future with smoke alarms and um, the current technologies that are used right across Europe and in the States and other countries where smoke alarms have been around for a long time. Um, you know, most of us are familiar with a battery operated smoke alarm. Uh, however, uh, the battery operated smoke alarm is being replaced. You know, the typical battery uh, replacement battery smoke alarm had a nine volt battery in it. It generally lasts, the battery had to be changed every year. Uh, it might last a couple of years depending on the quality of the battery, but the average battery that was bought by the consumer in the in their local DIY store or retailer might be a very cheap entry level battery, which might only last six months. We want to prevent that, uh, the fact that the batteries go die. We want to ensure that people do not take down the smoke alarm once they get the low battery beep. Therefore, we, over the years, we've been moving people towards mains powered batteries, main, mains powered alarms with battery backup, are a sealed in 10 year battery. And across most of Europe, a sealed in 10 year battery is pre proven to be a very effective product. But in a lot of countries such as UK, Ireland, Netherlands, Australia, North America, Canada and the States, um, it's been, the majority of products are mains powered batteries, main, mains powered alarms with battery backup. Uh, equally in Scandinavia, a lot of alarms are powered for their, their intrusion alarm. Uh, so that's all the kind of the, mainly this, the power supply end of things. Uh, with regard to the different types of sensors at the top of the slide there, uh, you will see more and more heat smoke alarm, heat CO, smoke CO combinations, depending on the risks of in the property which they're installed and the location. Because as I mentioned earlier, no smoke alarms in the kitchen should always be heat alarms. Uh, a heat smoke uh, alarm will be more sensitive in certain areas of so the, the technology today ensures that much uh, will reduce false alarms and give, you, give the occupants better protection depending on the location they are in the property. Okay. Uh, there is a dual supply advantage of uh, the mains powered alarm with battery backup, where if you have a power cut, which can frequently happen in the event of an electrical fault, perhaps in the in the home, which was causing the fire, uh, the power supply to the, to the uh, alarm heads will be cut, but the battery will keep it sounding for many hours after the power is cut. You know, it depends, depends on, the, on the on the quality of the battery, but again, but the important thing is it gives people enough time for a safe escape. Interconnection is what I mentioned there earlier on when I was showing the slides of the, with regard to the smoke. Um, one smoke alarm per property is only is all that's required in some countries. However, other countries require that you have multiple alarms. Once there is multiple alarms in the property, we always recommend that they should be interconnected. That way, if you have a, in this case here, an alarm set off in the garage, that the people on the top story uh, in the attic room will be warned because they probably won't hear the alarm at that distance or it'll be so far away. Uh, the, the, the important thing is to get the maximum level of sound to the bed head so you're going to wake a sleeping person. Uh, during the night, because as mentioned previously, 70% of fire deaths happen at night. Uh, interconnection is, uh, that for example was, it was wireless interconnection, but if you're talking about new build properties or renovated properties, uh, we recommend wired interconnection, because uh, it can be, you can pull the wires at the same time, the electrician can pull the wires and install the alarms at the same time as the property is being built. Back to heat alarms again. 
kitchens, this is one of the example I mentioned previously, uh, but anywhere where there's dust, steam, or other false alarms, uh, risks may occur. We do you know you want to avoid uh, you want to avoid any false alarms where possible. However, always connect a heat alarm to other smoke alarms in the property to, uh, to ensure that you get the earliest possible warning. And uh, again, doors are closed at night, and um, and uh, you know the the obviously if you, if a heat alarm is activated, it's over fifty degrees in the room. Therefore, if somebody goes into the room where the heat alarm is sounding. Is potential for an injury, immediate injury there. Other technologies uh, are such as remote monitoring are increasingly popular. It's a requirement of the installation standards in Germany, and it's been looked at in other countries as well, uh, where you can remotely check whether the smoke alarm is functioning correctly, uh, verify when it was last tested. Uh, by the occupant, verify that there is no obstructions uh, close to the alarm, which will prevent it from uh, prevent the smoke from getting to it quickly enough. For example, if a house is renovated in between the annual uh, uh, visit, and somebody moves moves uh, furniture or walls in the in turn inside the property, and uh, but doesn't move the smoke alarm. As again, the installation of the smoke alarm, the location of it is so important. It must be central in the room, which is best to have it on the ceiling. And uh, it's got to be in a position where it will detect the fire once, it, once, it, uh, once the fire starts. Okay, so US data, UK data, going back for many years now has shown us that 50% reduction in fire deaths is possible uh, when smoke alarms are installed in a property. The reality is that most countries in Europe, we don't have uh, smoke alarms installed. We have requirements in, in some countries, but even there, less than 50% of homes are equipping are equipped with working smoke alarms. Um, therefore, this is something that does need to be addressed. Uh, we emphasize that correctly installing the smoke alarms in your home reduces the number of fire deaths. Uh, we can save the lives of children or the elderly who may not react as quickly to fire danger. They give, we're giving the, the early warning to occupants to give them uh, time to get to safety. And uh, I would see the energy renovation programs as being an opportunity for a review of the fire safety in homes, which should include risk assessment and ensuring working smoke alarms are correctly fitted. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Hope that's sufficient. And if you're open to any questions, back to you. Thank you, thank you Shane. Um, okay, we have like uh, four minutes left of the session here, and I'd like to invite all of the speakers to come back in to turn their cameras on, those of you who can. And uh, I see also, Anne, you've been active in the chat. And we have a couple of questions for um, Olivier. One of the questions uh, is actually one that I had uh, prepared myself as well. Uh, Milo asks about the question of whether or not we're seeing an increase in uh, electrical fires based on the fact that we're getting a major increase in the number of electric vehicles that are being charged in people's homes. Uh, a green initiative that mm, might have unforeseen yeah, consequences. Yes, it's a, it's an interesting question, but uh, you know, um, EV charging are too much recent on the market uh, to be able to draw um, a, a trend at this stage. So um, we know that uh, there are uh, safety concern with. Uh, let's say, the new application of um, electricity. And uh, it's why we ask for um, electrical inspection uh, uh, when a new electrical equipment is installed in domestic area. When you install um, PV panels, when you install a EV charging point, when you install a heat pump, we think that um, at least the electrician need to check if the electrical installation is well designed, uh, let's say, to um, accept this new load. 
and in the best of the case, a full uh, um, electrical inspection uh, would be uh, better. So we think that this new application of electricity um, in uh, uh, in the homes uh, will be would be a trigger point uh, for uh, electrical installation. But um, you know, as or as I already explained, statistics and data are really difficult to access, and um, it's a bit a dream. Uh, to have really uh, the risk associated with um, one uh, one uh, specific application, it's not existing yet. But I hope that uh, in the future um, it will uh, getting better thanks to our um, uh, awareness campaign. Thank you. I know Anne, you're wanting to say something as well on that point. <laughs> yes, uh, because in Norway uh, we have a lot of electric cars. Uh, in fact, 13% of the car park know, is uh, <laughs> electric, and 57% of the new cars sold the uh, last half year were electric. Very impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so and and Rice Fire Research uh, had a small project so, a couple of years ago. Of course, then uh, the number of electric cars were not that big. But uh, we could not find any any uh, signs that uh, the the charging of of cars uh, posed any any significant uh, fire risk as long as you're using the the what is a correct uh, uh, application or what you would call it and and, and not uh, um, oh what do you call it when you're oh, coupling cord from cord, yeah. <laughs> So, so use, using electricity in a safe way, that's, that's the point. Exactly. But you can, we can mm. see any increased mm. risk. Okay, while, uh, I, while you're speaking, Anne, I had a question for you as well. One thing that I'm, uh, we've seen historically is that fire uh, standards and fire requirements have been driven very much by uh, incidents, fire incidents that have occurred. And in some of the new technologies that we're implementing now, we don't necessarily have the data. Not, I mean, obviously we don't have statistical data, but we also don't have actual incidents because so many of the new technologies are actually in new types of applications. So my question is, do you think we're naive by embracing wood buildings in the way that we are doing at the moment, or are we doing this in a safe way? Yeah, I, I, I would say we here, in this uh, society are not naive, but the world outside might be naive. And, and so I think the world is, is running uh, faster than uh, regulators and scientists are managing to, to hold uh, the pace. So, um, well, it, it, well, I, I think um, there, there, it's a problem there and regulations have to be, uh, what is a uh, uh, general to, to uh, take care of what comes in the future, there will be products that we have never thought about before. Like, what? who, who would think of, of you installing PV panels on your uh, walls and ceiling, uh, roof and, and uh, storing uh, energy in hydrogen or batteries or things like that? Maybe 10 years ago, it was not, not an option. Okay, so and get prepared. Yeah, the parallel session here has been about uh, regulations as well and whether or not regulations are able to, to meet the requirements of changes as we move forward. Uh, now, we're getting towards the end of our session, but I, I did want to also direct a question towards you, Shane. Um, one of the questions or one of the thoughts that I had when you were talking about recommendations of uh, closing off different parts of the buildings, we're seeing in modern buildings that very often the floor plan is very open. So yeah. how do we combat that using your kinds of technology? Well, we, in terms of residential open plan uh, living, uh, we recommend, I suppose, density of alarms is, is the key solution in terms of this. You know, for example, I know I have an open plan uh, kitchen living area with uh, a wood burning stove in my own home. Therefore, because close to the wood-burning stove, I have a carbon monoxide alarm in the main living area. There is a smoke alarm, and in the kitchen area, there is a heat alarm, and they're all interconnected. So they're detecting different risks in different locations in the, in the room. Um, I think, you know, it's, again, the density of alarms, I think, is the simplest solution. I think a risk evaluation, a risk assessment does need to be carried out by the architect or the engineer during the design of the property. 
and um, you know the owners uh, the landlords also need to uh, review this on a regular basis thank you well we are really at the close of our session here i'm sure we could talk for much much longer in this panel but uh, i'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all for your participation and very thought-provoking presentations I know that um, on the conference uh, platform here, it is possible to uh, find information about all of the speakers, uh, including myself as a moderator and the other sessions. And I would encourage you, if you have questions that haven't been addressed in today's session, that you take the opportunity to reach out to the specific speakers, approach them and ask them specific questions and continue the dialogue offline. Now I'd encourage you all to move to, I think in the lobby, there's an opportunity to have like speed meetings of different people participating in the session. It is a break right now. And uh, then there will be new sessions and then a final closure of the conference towards the end of the day. So an applause to you all and see you later. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, nice to see you finally, Sean. <laughs> That's right. I came out of hiding. <laughs> constantly, constantly adjusting my settings as I was talking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.